All right. Sorry, starting this is always a bit of a hassle. Uh, we're also doing this workshop as a hybrid workshop between uh, uh, Diamond Bar Walnut High School and Glennie Wilson High School over at the Diamond Bar campus. So, um, well, we can start now. So welcome everyone to, this is 4X08. This is a soldering workshop. It's like one workshop earlier than last time, but it's always the most exciting one because, uh, well, you guys have a kit in front of you and you'll be able to build it. And hopefully by the end of today, you'll be able to see it work. So always a very exciting workshop. Um, this semester, or every semester, we get a kit specially commissioned ex exactly for this workshop. So you won't be able to see this anywhere else until after the workshop, that is. So uh, this semester is going to be a completely different circuit than last semester. So if you were here last semester, uh, you'll get a completely new experience. Just a show of hands, how many of you have been here last semester? Just raise your hands. Some of you? Very cool. For, and then I guess uh, the other half, um, how many of you guys are here for the for very first time? Raise your hands. Wow, that's amazing. That's almost like all of you. So uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been here before, my name is Chris Sly. I am the president of CPP Hyperloop, and this is our workshop series. We hold one workshop every week, and this one is always, almost, the, almost always the most popular one. Uh, so let's get started. This one is soldering. So always, I like to introduce every topic by explaining uh, why we learn it in the first place. Because as you might know, you're here, you're, this is like the Friday afternoon. This is actually the Friday before spring break. So a lot of students actually aren't here at this time, but I am very glad that you are. For Diamond Bar students, you guys don't have spring break until like a week later. But for college students, spring break actually starts tomorrow. So yay. But again, I thank you so much for coming to this workshop and taking your time to learn some essential industry skills. Because soldering, is an essential skill if you're going into electronics, if you're doing hobbyist, or if you're just building robots. And unfortunately, they don't teach that enough at this college. Actually, if you're in the electrical engineering department, they don't teach that at all. You have to learn it from a project or this workshop. So that was one of the main motivations of learning how to solder. But exactly what is soldering? So soldering is the practice of just melting wire or mel melting what we call solder wire, like this lead or tin or it can be made of anything, just melting wire onto a board known as a PCB. If you are here from the PCB design workshop, you'll know that a PCB is just an integrate, contains a circuit inside of it. So if you've ever seen like wires on a breadboard, a breadboard being like this uh, prototyping board that you can stick wires into, a PCB is a much concise version of that. You see PCBs everywhere from inside your computer to inside your phone. And if you've been in any of the projects I've I've been in, you'll see that I use PCBs a lot because I don't like wiring things. I like just having some template there I can just solder stuff onto and have it work for me. So PCBs are a simplification of a circuit. And in order for us to put components onto the PCB, we need to use solder. So we'll have components that are usually some kind of metal based component, and we can melt wire between the component and the PCB, which just sticks it onto the PCB itself. So it's kind of like welding, if you know what welding is, but a very safer and much easier form of welding. Like you won't see sparks or anything. Yes. Are we doing a flux into the solder the wire or do we apply flux? That's a really good question. So there are both kinds of flux inside the room. What you're asking is known as flux core solder. And we'll talk about flux a little bit later, but we are going to be using flux core solder. I personally think that's a little bit easier on my part. Okay, there are three types of ways you can solder, really. The first one is through hole. If you guys know the term THT, it stands for through hole component. These through holes are kind of like um, components that you can put all the way through the board, like this hole right here, or this hole right here, or just generally like most components come with through hole, com uh, through hole methods of putting into the PCB. If it goes through the entire PCB, it's known as through hole. The next type of soldering is called SMD soldering. This is a little more difficult, but uh, it's like a step up from through hole, and people don't usually do SMD soldering until they're more advanced. But lucky for you guys, you'll get to do SMD soldering today. There's one component on your PCB that is an SMD component. And SMD stands for surface mount device. So as you can see, for the difference of THT, surface mount device is just soldered directly onto one side of the board, and you can't see anything on the back side, right? It only uh, will solder onto the pad. These are pads, by the way, on one side of the PCB. So SMD components are generally smaller than THT components, but you know, with if the components are smaller, then you can fit more on a PCB, right? You don't want a PCB to be very, very big because A, it's expensive, 
B, it's complicated. So minimizing your footprint, as we call it, or the area in which the components go on a PCB is really important. In this scenario, you are making smaller components so that you can make your board a lot smaller. But again, it's also really hard to uh, solder components that are smaller because you need more precision, uh, you need more stability, uh, but it is more efficient. It's, it's an art, I like to call it. And for you electrical engineers out there looking to work with power, there's also wire soldering. This is known as an engineer's knot. If you're, you're working with large gauge wires that transmits a large amount of power, such as maybe soldering like a power cord together, like that goes in a wall, or maybe like putting together like wires for a drone, for example, you might have to endure something called uh, wire soldering or the engineer's knot. This is just putting two pieces of separate wire together. Usually um, they have like copper threads like this in order to just, you know, combine them, make the electrically flow from like one side to three wires, for example. So just those are basic soldering connections. Now let's talk about solder connections for a bit. In, a, in about maybe 15, 20 minutes, we'll do a live demo of actually me soldering, just so you get an idea of what to expect and what not to expect during the lab. Uh, for those of you who attended last semester, we didn't do that, but um, I think it would be helpful if you all saw what a good or bad solder connection looks like if I do it live. But in general, you can follow this guide to see like what good and bad solder connections are. When we solder, we want to avoid cold joints and make our joints when we solder the board to the connection, look like a Hershey's Kiss. I'm sure everyone knows what a Hershey's Kiss is or has that in mind. It looks kind of like, kind of like this, right? Where it's a large bottom and then a small top. We want to get this in every single one of our solder connections. We don't want too little solder, like this image right here, where it says insufficient wetting between the pin and the pad, and part of the solder connection is just non-existent. We don't want too much solder, where it looks like a dome, right? It looks like a stadium in which both of these are known as cold joints because they'll eventually become brittle and break apart. And we don't want that because if we solder some components together, we want them to stay forever, right? We don't want our components to fall out if we throw them at the wall, uh, shoot a gun at it, or just, you know, like step on it really hard. We want it to stay on forever. After all, this is, you know, basically metal welding. Metal heats up at very high temperatures, so if you're just handling the circuit at room temperature, you don't want the metal to come apart, right? So here's just a general understanding of solder connections, and we'll go more deeply into this. When you guys actually solder for the first time, a lot of you will actually look, your solder joints will actually look either like uh, too little or too much, but as you keep soldering, you'll get some uh, muscle memory in order to actually solder uh, real, uh, realistically a lot smoother every single time. So this is kind of like a, a hobby that gets easier as you go on. So here is a side overview of good and bad solder connections. Again, the one on the left is perfect. It's like a Hershey's Kiss, right? Large at the bottom and then slowly sloping towards the top where it's narrow. Every single other one is bad because it doesn't form a good enough connection between the component and the board, right? A for, for example, A, the solder literally doesn't touch the board, right? So it's basically the same thing as just putting a resistor inside of a THT component, putting a resistor inside of a PCB. Like it won't make a good enough electrical connection and then you wonder why your circuit doesn't work, right? B is bad because again, this looks like a cold joint. It looks like brittle on the outsides, which means that if you like hit it hard enough with something, it'll like shatter apart. C is bad because obviously it's not even touching. Like what is this? Uh, D and E, are also very bad, although like you might not know it at the first glance because it looks like a Hershey's kiss on this side, it looks like a Hershey's kiss on this side. Does anyone know why D and E are bad? Yeah? The circuit. Right, we made a short circuit here. Whenever you solder, especially for capacitors today, and just keep that in mind, you want to avoid this scenario because it's very, very easy to do so. Here it's magnified, but when you're soldering a very tiny component like a capacitor, you might accidentally like short circuit and not even know it. In fact, that was one of the most common mistakes we saw last semester when we did this for Blicky Learner 2, is that people would accidentally solder the capacitor legs together, creating a short. And that would just heat up the entire board, make it hot, make it uh, not like you. So be sure to be very careful when soldering small components together. You can inspect it under like a bright light just to make sure they're not touching, or you can use a multimeter to measure between the pins. A multimeter has something called a continuity checker, which means if you take the two ends of a multimeter and put them across both pins, the multimeter will beep if it's continuous, which means it'll beep if you have a short circuit between D and E, right? So you can use a multimeter to be able to prevent that from happening. 
in general though, try to aim for this. And we'll talk about different things in soldering in which uh, would help make you good connections. So I talked about cold joints for a bit, but here's a more drastic example in like real, real life as to like what cold joints actually look like. On the left here, this looks like a Hershey's kiss, right? But it's actually not that great because you can see like you can see basically see the air or the oxygen bubbles trapped inside of the solder because it's not clear it's not smooth it's not a good finish compared to the right side right. And the right side, you can see there's like a gleam on it it's very smooth like there's just metal in there there's no like anything trapped inside of it. Sometimes you'll get cold joints because the materials or the equipment you use is not good enough. It's not good enough to melt the metal that well. It could be that your metal sucks, your soldering iron sucks, or just some other variable in between is not that great, right? And a lot of times what I see happen is students will come to me saying that um, their soldering joints are not that great. And most of the time it's because they're using suboptimal equipment. Amazon sells like basic soldering kits for like almost $17, right? And those soldering kits often come with really, really bad solder wire. When I say solder wire, I mean the metal here. And the most common thing they would give you is really cheap solder wire made out of tin, made out of aluminum, made out of some metal that's just not great for soldering, right? The solder you're going to be using today is flux core solder. It's 4060 tin lead. Now there is lead in it, so uh, it is a little bit dangerous, but I will talk about how to avoid uh, you know, being totally harmed by it. Now, again, the issue with uh, not having a good joint is mainly because of the equipment you use. So you want to get a good soldering iron and you want to get good uh, solder wire. Now, we have to compensate with the material you're going to be using today because, you know, we can't get everyone like really nice soldering irons. We're not that rich, but we got you really good solder wire instead. And the solder wire you're going to be using today is known as flux core wire. And we'll explain what that is in a bit. So again, we talked about soldering irons. You can either get really cheap ones like the one on the left and, or really expensive ones like the one on the right. This one is actually uh, my soldering iron from my home. I bought this for about 50 bucks and I brought it here to demonstrate for you today. But really, the soldering irons in the left kit do work. I just found out from my experience, it's best if you upgrade the solder to a higher tier solder. Either uh, have it like a tin flux core lead or, uh, or a lead flux core wire in order for your wire to melt better in order to not you know, get a cold joint. The problem with non-leaded solder is because it takes a higher melting temperature to actually get it to melt properly. That's why you often see you trying to like crank this temperature up to like the maximum in order to get non-leaded solder to work. It's generally a hassle. Uh, lead tin uh, solder actually melts better and creates that nice smooth uh, oxidized solder joint you saw in the previous slide. So that's what I recommend. Now, I'm going way ahead of myself in that this is actually pretty good. Uh, you can see the solder wire, uh, the aspects of the solder wire listed on the actual uh, reel itself. You can see SN60, so it's 1060 and lead 40, 1.8% flux, 0 0.6 millimeter diameter, and G GW50 grams, the uh, gross weight. So in order for us to understand why we use this, or like why I recommend this, we have to understand what flux is first. So I will skip this slide for now. I'll also skip this slide, but I wanna talk about flux first. Okay, flux, if you don't use flux core solder, or flux is basically like magic. If you put it on your solder connections, it will remove all the little oxygen bubbles inside of it, creating a really smooth connection. Right? And there are multiple different kinds of flux. You have flux paste, you have flux pens, you have flux that you can inject into your board. We have all three different kinds of flux uh, in the lab. We also have flux rosin, right? So flux is basically um, great if you want to work with, let's say SMD components and a heat gun because it melts it quickly, it puts everything into place, and it's generally like really awesome to use. But for your application, if you're just soldering THT components together, some of the lead or the, some of the solder wire actually comes with flux embedded inside of it, which is awesome. It's like an invention of the century because as you're soldering, the flux inside of the wire actually goes into your connections, automatically making it way more smooth than it is before. Now, unfortunately, I don't know if they have invented non-leaded 
flux core solder yet. So uh, that would be the next step up or the innovation for these kind of solder wires because it's less dangerous and you still get the nice smooth finish you have on your PCB. But that's why I recommend generally to use this kind of solder because your flux is already inside of it. So you don't need to apply extra flux. As I remember the first time we did this, I saw a lot of students actually like pouring flux onto the board and I got really scared because uh, you shouldn't use that much flux because flux burns and it'll leave marks in your PCB. And too much flux is actually bad for you. So it's kind of distributed evenly inside of the solder already. So if you look at the cross section of a wire, the outside will be all metal and the inside will be a little cylinder of flux. So I answered the question, why not lead-free, right? You don't want to use lead-free solder or you, lead-free solder is suboptimal due to its higher melting temperature. And it'll be harder to, if you have a bad soldering iron to actually melt that down. But if you have a good soldering iron that can go at very high temperatures, then you can use lead solder. You may have to use flux, or sorry, non-lead solder, and you may have to use flux. Now, the quite, quite real question is soldering is a little bit dangerous, as with everything we do in life, right? Everything we do in life is a little bit dangerous. So how do we protect ourselves? One of the ways I protect myself is using an exhaust. Now, I have this box exhaust fan made by Koto, and you'll soon see a lot of the things I have actually are kind of expensive. This box fan is $50, almost now. But it's really great. If you turn it on, which is not plugged in right now, a fan will blow to the back of it, sucking all the solder fumes out. Now, solder fumes can be dangerous. Solder fumes, if you look at the, um, or if you use the lead core solder, is usually consisted of the burnt flux. So the solder fumes that come out is just flux, but it's an irritant, right? Flux is an irritant in that if you breathe it in, it will cause your lungs, your eyes, your nose, your ears to become a little bit more sensitive and a little bit more swollen. Happened to me a lot. You try to want to avoid it generally. You can prevent it by wearing a mask. And we should have some masks around building nine you can go ahead and take a look at or grab. Uh, or you can use one of these box fans. Now, unfortunately, we don't have box fans uh, today. So I would recommend you get a mask if you can. But uh, you don't want to just like go over the soldering iron and inhale them. What I usually do when I don't have a box fan is I would just solder. And then I would just uh, take my head away and just breathe in some clean air and then go back to soldering. Because again, you don't want to just sniff this stuff. It's not gr that great. Now, some people will pose the argument as to if you're using lead solder, these fumes will contain lead. That's not that true. These fumes do not contain lead if you're using solder. These mainly contain uh, just the flux. So why is that lead dangerous? Well, lead is kind of dangerous because if you touch it that much, if you touch lead, some little particulates will actually go into your skin and then stay in your body forever. That's how lead poisoning happens. You're saying that to scare you, but there's not enough lead inside the solder to actually do that. So if you want to handle it with your hands, bare hands, you can. But just I recommend washing your hands right after you finish soldering. So after the workshop, I want everyone to go to the bathroom and wash your hands. All right, everyone got that? It's one thing I need to take, I need you to take away from this is wash your hands. <laughs> you get rid of the lead. You don't suffer from lead poisoning. I mean, I've been soldering for like almost five years now. I'm still fine. Look, I'm, I'm still like standing here lecturing. So again, after this workshop, make sure you wash your hands, uh, then you'll be completely fine. If you're still scared, you can handle solder using pliers. I sometimes do that, or I wear black gloves when handling solder paste uh, because it's like much more minute. But in general, uh, just today, just be aware of the safety concerns regarding this kind of solder. But I will cover that in the uh, safety part of this lecture next. Tip tinner is a little slab of metal that you can dip your soldering iron in. It's usually used to revive your soldering iron only. So it's a little bit, blo a little bit block of metal um, that if your soldering iron has too much use, it'll start to degrade. It will start to become brittle. Like the tip will literally start breaking off. That's actually what happened this morning when I made a walkthrough video of the soldering kit you guys are going to be using, uh, in which I had to like start replacing it. But if your soldering iron looks dead, and you'll know when it looks dead because it doesn't look shiny anymore, it looks like gray and dead, you can use this uh, tip tinner to be able to revive it. it. This little tin right here is, it's about this big actually. It's about $6. So it's expensive, but um, it's ex extremely effective because your tip of the soldering iron actually really matters when you want to make a good joint. Conductivity matters, right? Everything you do in soldering makes, basically you want the best conductivity ever between your component and the PCB. This is one of the ways you can uh, save that on your soldering iron. 
Solder sponges are great uh, because they help make the solder tip more clean. Now, we don't have many solder sponges today, but my dad went ahead and grabbed like 20 something, 30 or something of the regular sponges we can like use water for um, that you can actually use instead of the solder sponges. When you're using a regular sponge and you're using it to, to clean your solder tip, make sure you wet it first. Do not put the soldering iron on a dry sponge because what will happen is that you'll burn the sponge. You'll create like a black spot and it'll, be, it'll, it'll not be good. It won't clean your iron. It'll just cause sadness. So make sure your sponge is wet before you actually dip your soldering iron in it. Okay, you can skip this slide. Desoldering tools. Okay, what if you make a mistake? Because I'm sure a lot of you will actually make a mistake today and wonder how you can fix it because, you know, some of the things on the PCB are polarized. So you might maybe put an LED backwards, you might put a capacitor backwards, and you might want to fix that, right? So there are a couple ways to desolder things, but generally it's kind of hard to desolder. So you can either use a wick or you can use this pump. Now I actually do have this pump here, because I made a joke with one of my friends that I would get this um, if I won a bet, which I did. So this is the Koto soldering uh, vacuum. It's very expensive. It's like 20 bucks, but it's like the Gucci of soldering, soldering suckers, I call it, because it's very good at what it does. What this does is it creates a vacuum between your PCB and your board. So when you heat the connection and you press this plunger, it sucks the solder right out of the board. It's really great. Great tool. The wick actually uh, experiences the same thing. If you want to remove something, cut off a piece of wick and apply it to the board. The solder will then attach to the wick instead of the board. All right, but you don't want to hold the solder wick with your bare hands because what will happen is you will get burnt. I see chat. Fix the webcam, we can't see. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> How's that? Okay, so don't hold this with your bare hands while you're like trying to remove solder. I've burned myself on this once, I've learned my lesson, I'm passing this knowledge on to you. Don't make the same mistake. Okay, helping hands. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the budget to get you guys like 30 of these. Actually, we have like 48 stations set up, but helping hands are great because they hold your components together for you to start soldering them. So they don't move around while you solder. Now, uh, you can use masking tape, which we have a bunch of rolls of to hold the PCB down while you solder, or you can use some other methods that appear in my video that I've made. But helping hands are generally very useful. Uh, you can have this stand, which I actually very much hate, but it's cheaper, or you can get one of these great stands with a weighted base. The reason I hate this, and it comes in like every single like introductory uh, soldering kit, is because the base is really flimsy. It's like a small base and like a wide top, so structurally it doesn't make sense. Like you try to put something on this and it just falls over. I don't know why this exists, but it does. The, this is a better solution because the base is weighted, so it's really heavy on the base, which means you can attach stuff to the top and it'll stay still. These are kind of like octopus arms in which they extend, they kind of bend back and forth in all three dimensions in order to hold your component in the right place. Really useful. Oh, this last slide, if you want to do heat shrinking, if you're like making wires or whatnot, you don't want to leave anything electrically exposed. So usually what you do is you apply some heat shrink to the wires. This is in separate kind of equipment. Actually, my soldering tool right here does have a heat gun ex uh, extension to it where I can actually pump hot air onto a PCB to melt some solder paste. But, you know, if you want to get this, you can. Okay, before I move on, are there any questions as to the components of soldering before I go into safety? Okay, I know me just you know, usually telling you this stuff doesn't like really get into your head until you actually like work with it. I mean, that's why Cal Poly Pomona is a learn by doing college. I see a question in the chat. Just kidding, no. <laughs> All right, moving on to soldering safety. Okay, if you weren't listening to section one, please listen now because I don't want people getting hurt. You know, I always say like in the history of the soldering workshop, no one has ever gotten hurt except for me when I accidentally burned myself during the last soldering workshop. So, you know, this is really effective. So please listen to this. Okay, there are a few different ways to keep safe when soldering. Well, because soldering is handling a really, really hot iron melting metal onto a board, there are a lot of inert, inert dangers. 
the first thing you can do is to wear proper attire. So you can usually do this by wearing closed-toed shoes, tying your hair back, just making sure that nothing's in the way while you solder, just being really safe on that front. Well, okay, tie hair back, no open-toed shoes. It's like I'm protecting myself. <laughs> now, the second thing is to watch out for solder splash. Now, I don't know if a lot of safety lectures actually cover this or not, but the phenomenon of solder splash is when you're working with solder that is pretty old and hasn't been used for a long time, it gets really reactive. And kind of like when you're cooking and oil starts splashing back at you, solder will also start splashing back at you. So I've had it happen to me where like I'm soldering and then suddenly like some solder just like splashes out and then hits my hand and then it's a bit painful. It's like getting a shot. But just watch out for that. And the way you can save yourself from this is just to use nice equipment. Don't wait until your solder goes old. Every solder tube you're going to be using today is brand new. I literally just got it yesterday. So this shouldn't happen to you. But if you're soldering in the future and you want to avoid this, just use good solder. Use good quality solder. Don't cheap out on this stuff. OK, this is a very, 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 and I'm going to say very, uh, I'm going to say again, very, very important part. You always want to assume the soldering iron is hot. I'm going to assume this soldering iron is hot. It's not even plugged in, but it's hot. Reason being that you don't want to burn yourself on this. It's very painful. Like, it heats up to about 450 degrees Celsius. Actually, Fahrenheit. <laughs> Just kidding. Still, it's still pretty bad. But it's like 190 degrees Celsius, 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it will burn your skin. It will cook meat. Actually, it will like overcook meat. So when you're done soldering, right, and you turn off your soldering iron, let's say it's unplugged, you just finished soldering, and you unplug your soldering iron, this is still going to be hot, right? Because there's residual heat on this. And the soldering iron is going to remain hot for about 15 to 30 minutes after it's been unplugged, right? It's metal, so it's going to keep its heat. So even if it's unplugged, even when you're done using the soldering iron, do not touch the tip. Even after that, I'm, not, I'm still scared to touch the tip because I'm going to assume it's hot, OK? If you want to like, exchange the tip, if your tip is broken, use pliers to exchange it with a new one. Do not touch the tip, OK? If you just follow this one simple rule, I assure you, none of you are going to get hurt. Do not touch the tip. Everyone got that? Words to live by. What? Sorry? Words to live by. Words to live by. Assume the soldering iron is hot, all right? There are more rules, but this is kind of like the number one rule you got to follow just to make sure you don't get hurt. That's my next bullet point. Always tin your iron before using it. Uh, this used to be a good rule, but um, generally today, you're, a lot of the soldering irons are actually brand new. I got some funding to get you guys brand new soldering irons this semester. Uh, so a lot of the soldering irons are brand new, which they don't need tinning. If only tin your iron when you see like rusting or like it looks like grayed out on the tip. Some irons are actually like that. But if your iron looks shiny on the top, it does not need tinning. You can just ignore the step, okay? Remember, tinning is only used for reviving your soldering iron. Oh, good. Assume your iron is hot at all times or on at all times. I said it again. Very important rule. OK, who can tell me what's wrong with this picture? Yeah? She's touching the tip. Stock photos, I tell you. Like, man. Yeah, actually, bruh. So, like, stock photos will kind of mislead you, but definitely this is bad because the solder iron is literally like steaming from the outside. So, don't touch the tip. Her hand's probably cooked by now. She probably has to get that amputated. I don't know, 30 degree burns everywhere. All right? So, what did we learn from this slide? Don't touch the tip. Don't touch the tip. Great. Okay, next slide. This one's a bit better of the stock image, but still, there's something wrong with it. Anyone want to try and try answer? I think only people who have actually soldered before will understand what's going on. So what happens in this image is that his fingers right here are way too close to the solder tip. What happens is that even if your fingers are positioned this close, your fingers will get burnt. Because again, residual heat exists, right? He will expand from this little tip here and start burning your fingers, even if it's not touching it. It gets hot near there, and I've experienced it before. So when you're holding your soldering iron, you want to hold it like at the back area. 
like if you hold it any closer than that, even like this little rubber ring here, you might get burnt. So this area in the back where the, you have like a rubber grip is the safest. Don't pull it way too close where your like fingers like right next to it. Because I assure you, the insides of your hand are not going to feel great after you solder. All right, so hold it on the back, hold it safely. Don't touch the tip at all times. So don't touch the tip. Great. The high schoolers get it. <laughs> so always place the soldering iron back in its holder before doing anything else. Now, this one's a little bit um, going to be a little bit uh, of a safety concern today because some of these soldering irons actually don't have a holder. You want to place it in a safe location before going to do anything else. So if there's no holder, make sure you unplug it from the wall. All right. So if I'm done soldering, I want to make sure I put it back in there before I do anything else. Because the thing is, this soldering iron is connected to a wire, right? And the cool thing about wires is that they're connected to something like the soldering station. So if I accidentally drop this, what will happen? The thing's going to go flying, right? It might not go flying on the ground, but it's going to go flying. And nothing is scarier than having a hot soldering iron fly through the air. Very, very dangerous. So generally, place the iron back in the toilet before doing anything else. Also, allow for some slack in the power cord. Uh, what I mean by slack is that my microphone has slack with the ground and the computer, right? It's not like taut. If I go all the way over here, you can see that this is taut. This is very bad for a soldering iron, again, because someone can trip over this, right? If they trip over this, then the soldering iron goes flying. You're going to have a problem, right? So allow for some slack in the power cord. Also, turn devices off when not using them for a long time. And in this case, for today, if you're not using the soldering iron, please unplug it from the wall. If you're at home and you're just you know, putting the soldering iron back to fold some resistors, uh, then you can like, leave it on. But today, because of the new soldering irons that don't have a solder stand, please unplug them from the wall before going to fold resistors or something. I don't know. Ventilate the area. This is very important because you don't want to be smelling those fumes for a long period of time. Again, remember that fumes, solder fumes, are an irritant. They're not directly harmful to your body, but they will irritate you. Your lungs may feel a little clogged up. Your nose will feel a little clogged up. Your sinuses may feel a little clogged up afterwards. Um, but generally, even, even here, we want to ventilate the area. All the doors will be open. We'll try to fan out as much of the fumes as possible in both lab rooms. You never want to be in a closed space while soldering. Like the worst scenario is if your lab is inside your closet and you're soldering and there's no way for the fumes to get out, right? They're just stuck there. So. Ventilation is key. Oh, this still applies. I had this on for the first time we did this workshop, but don't stare into the LEDs for a long period of time. Like, it's better now, but uh, the deal of the LEDs I got are that they are super bright LEDs, which means that if you stare into the LEDs for like a long period of time, you might go temporarily blind. Uh, if they're a bit bright, I would say. But just like playing with it sometimes will, will be fine. They're not that bright anymore. Just a warning. Even like with like regular LEDs, if not, if not in the kit you have, sometimes those will get really, really bright as well because they're powered by electricity. So just be careful. Before we go on, what's the number one rule? Don't touch the tip. Always assume it's hot. Everyone got it? All right. Now we're going to go over some circuit analysis. We're going to go over the circuit here. Like, what are we building today? And before I even like show you guys the circuit, I want to show you guys what it looks like or how you, what the finished product will be like. I have a test kit here, in which I built this kit for a demonstration. This is a LED chaser. It's a um, LED attached to some shift registers attached to a 555 timer as a clock. So what happens is when you turn it on and rotate the potentiometer, you'll see this LED will blink at a certain frequency, right? Certain frequency. Uh, created by the voltage coming out of the 555 timer. So the rate at which it blinks will be the rate at which the LED chases around the circle, right? If you hold the button, the LED will activate. When you let go of the button, it'll deactivate. It's kind of like a little fidget toy, if you will. You can make it go faster by rotating the potentiometer. Right, it's going faster now. Or you can make it go a lot slower, like this. Now, an added feature is that if you take an Arduino and put its data pin into this little uh, bottom right corner right here, 
this will allow you to do cool things like turn on or make it play music from like an Arduino or make it react to music. Actually, the DLC, if you will, for this kit is a music reactive um, sound player. So we will release that after after the workshop if you like to continue playing with this. So uh, again, I think it's pretty cool. I, I, Yash, Yash, the person who created this actually extension is unfortunately not here today, but we will, we will release it after the workshop if you would like to play with it further. So I'm gonna hand this around so you guys can take a look at what's going on. And I'll go over the circuit really quickly. So at least you understand what's going on inside of the PCB. Okay, so for those of you who went to the PCB design workshop, we went from circuit schematic to PCB routing. Uh, and the way we went about this is every PCB starts from a schematic. And this is what a schematic looks like. There's a bunch of circuits here that will tell you like what's going on in the PCB. Now for every single circuit, there's usually the brains of the circuit, right? There's usually one part of the circuit in which it's the most important. And that's right here. This is the shift register. This is what causes the LEDs to blink. It's what caused the LEDs to go from one side to the other. These chips are the 74HC5958 bit shift register. This is a serial in parallel out register. What that means is you will put in one string of data and then eight individual strings of data will come out of it. Right, and you can use that one initial string of data to turn on the rest. And there's conf the configuration of um, wires going into the shift register allows you to multiply the effect, right? Because one shift register is eight bits, which only turns on eight LEDs. But we could, because we have sixteen LEDs in our circuit, we can have two shift registers to do it. It's more complicated, but it's also more fun. Now, the other circuits in this picture are there to assist it are there to give it user utility it's why you're able to for example turn on the circuit or turn off the circuit it's why you're able to see the led flashing coming out of the timer so the reason why the leds are able to automatically flash and chase each other if you will throughout the circuit is because of this 555 timer a stable multi-vibrator circuit on the top right corner this 555 timer is a very common electronic component that creates some sort of clock signal. A clock signal is any signal that just goes from zero to one at a set rate, right? This circuit right here on the left is what causes that rate. It's what gives you the range of slow, slow blinking and to fast blinking uh, that you see with when turning the potentiometer. It's mainly the combination between this resistor and this capacitor, what's known as the RC circuit, for those of you who are more advanced. This circuit on the right here is what causes the blinking. The blinking of the um, blue LED you see in the center there. This is a uh, pretty much the output of the 555 timer goes into a uh, transistor. And this transistor amplifies the current coming out of the 555 timer and uses it to power the LED. Because when you put current through the base of a transistor, it enters saturation mode, which means the five volts and the top of the LED connect together in a short circuit which means that we're able to see the LED turn on. Because normally, at the output of the timer, it doesn't have enough voltage or may not have enough current to be able to turn this LED on. Next, we move on to this circuit right here, which is a simple toggle push button circuit, right? It allows you to be able to push the button and have this little push toggle label here go directly into the, um, well, it goes into this circuit. But this push toggle eventually goes into toggle, which, uh, which turns on the 55 timer and turns on the LED subsequently. And down here, this is just a switch to be able to switch between data and the Arduino. Because again, you're able to put any signal, any old signal from an Arduino or other microcontroller into this circuit and make it show custom you know, blinking patterns. I think it's pretty cool. And then finally, the whole circuit that makes it not explode from a 9 volt battery is the top left circuit right here. Does anyone remember what the circuit is from the PCB design workshop? If you went to the PCB design workshop. The whole circuit, I guess. It is a step down circuit. So you're also right, it does control noise, but that's only part of the circuit. The entire purpose of this circuit is to make sure it regulates the voltage from nine volts to five volts. Because remember, in every project, you'll have to use power at some point. And in this case, our power source is a nine volt battery. So we regulate nine volts to five volts, and we use these capacitors to filter out noise. 
This is like one of the essential circuits we covered in the PCB design workshop because almost every circuit has some sort of like power mechanism to provide your entire circuit with clean power. So pretty much if we didn't have the circuit, the entire rest of this will work. Are there any questions? Right, so now you understand what's inside your PCB. Oh, oh, okay. This is the uh, PCB design. Actually, Maggie in the back there was the one who designed this whole PCB. So uh, it looks great, actually. Um, Josh Carwell was the circuit maker. Uh, so this was a collaboration effort between almost three engineers here at CPP uh, to bring you this sort of like circuit kit. Here's a 3D model for it. I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, it's missing some components because there's no 3D models for that, but in general, that's what we're working with here. So we designed the PCB in KiCad, and then we exported it to a Gerber file, sent it to JLC PCB for making, and then I got it and tested it at home like a couple weeks ago. We mass produced it, and now we're here. It's been a labor of love. Okay, I will post this video onto the uh, Hyperloop server so that you can follow it and follow along with the guide. It just basically goes through like me putting one of these things together. Now, I'll tell you that it did take me about 43, 44 minutes to put this whole kit together, which when multiplied by 2.5 will take you guys around two and a half hours. Now, if you're really fast, you'll finish it on time today. But generally, if you don't get to finish it, you are able to finish at home if you have your own soldering iron. Uh, we hope that this workshop kind of encourages you to get a soldering iron uh, and you can ask us for recommendations or look at the PowerPoint for recommendations. If you don't have a soldering iron, you can visit uh, the makerspace here on campus, the innovation labs, or you, you can come to one of our future workshops. I think uh, on the 4X11 workshop, we'll have some soldering iron set up so that you can go ahead and solder on your own. But this goes over like all the steps. Um, and you can see like, I even like do a little bit zooming in later on the video to showcase like what the solder connections look like. Uh, and you can see like the tip is a little dead as I said before, but generally that's what you want to go ahead and do. Get everything soldered together, get everything working. Um, you can cut off these wires afterwards, but I won't give too many spoilers because I want to go ahead and do this myself here. That's why I brought this like really nice webcam. So I'm going to go ahead and set up the stuff to showcase this. Uh, just really, really quickly before I let you go ahead and go to the lab, just because I want to get you guys started on making this before um, actually going to the lab. So I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to move this computer over here so that I can use the space to do you get the sponges. So we're going to move this um, over here to this computer. So on that, that side? Yeah. Oh, this, this, this. So I still need to keep this alive. Okay. Next book. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Can everyone see my setup? And did I disconnect everything in po any, anything in the process? Okay. There are a few key things I want you to look for uh, while you solder this. So I think it's a good idea to... Uh, or you should pay attention to, uh, for this section as well. Okay. So I'm going to turn this on. This is pretty loud next to me. But uh, this is the solder sucker. I'm going to be using it just so I don't blow fumes everywhere in this room. So it'll be containing uh, to this section right here. But 
I will go ahead and give you some tips and tricks on how to solder this board together. Uh, I think you can see it on there. Just before you actually go to the lab. Okay. So you'll see on this board there's a lot of components. We'll go over resistors first. In order to solder this without uh, actually needing any like helping hands, you can, you can use some tricks to be able to solder things like resistors onto the board. So in this scenario, what I like to do is I like, I like to bend the resistors, put them in the holes, and this works for resistors, LEDs, capacitors, any other component, similar component to that. I will put this in the hole, and then on the back, I will bend the legs to the side because this will lock the resistor in place. The resistor is not going to move from this location, which means I can then go ahead and solder it directly onto the board. Things a little closer. Well, that sounds really nice. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my soldering iron. And I'll show you like what happens if you don't want to actually use your hands to touch this solder lead. I use these uh, pliers to do so. And this is actually a brand new tip because I destroyed the old tip. So when your soldering iron gets hot enough, you want to go ahead and put your soldering tip on the wire and the PCB at the same time. That's where you're going to heat. You're going to heat up the wire and the PCB at the same time and then apply the solder lead directly to the PCB like this. Now you'll notice that when I do that, I'm applying the solder wire onto the hot end of the soldering iron. That's like a little trick they don't teach you because they always tell you to um, put the solder wire into the PCB. But because the tip of the soldering iron is where the hot end is, you want to melt it on the soldering iron top like that, right? I'm touching the solder wire onto the top of the soldering iron, which melts the solder into the board, right? So that's like a tip you can use. And after, after you've soldered a resistor onto the board like this, you can then use your wire cutters to be able to cut off the ends. Like so. And then you can uh, put these in a nice little pile and then throw them away later. But now we've had a nice little solder connection right here. And we can see that the resistor is nicely soldered onto the front of the board, right? Now resistors are not polarized. Does anyone know what the word polarized means? It's directional, which means some components on this board come in only one direction. Some components like the LEDs, right? So let's solder an LED to the board right now for demonstration. I'll use a blue LED for Hyperloop. Okay, so I'm gonna solder a blue LED to where it says LED here. Now, every time you see LED, you'll notice that it has a negative sign and a plus sign. And you'll notice that little, this little symbol on the side of the board represents what side you should solder it to, right? Because the longer leg is always the positive end. So here, the longer leg is on the left side, the shorter leg is on the right side. Okay? Now, be very careful on this because desoldering is a pain in the butt, and you don't want to go ahead and do that uh, all for all of them. So be careful when putting the LED in the board and make sure that the positive side is where the plus sign is and the negative side is where the minus sign is. Everyone got that? Cool. So I'm going to put this LED in. And then you can do the exact same thing as before, in which you just hold it down under the PCB like this. And then on the back, you just bend the legs outwards, and you will lock it into place. Now, you can do this for like all the LEDs before soldering it. Usually, that part's faster. You don't have to put the LED in, solder it, go to the next LED, solder it, and vice versa. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and solder this LED in the board. And it's basically the same as before, where I'm going to heat my soldering up or soldering iron up. I'm going to put my soldering iron onto the PCB, like so, right? I'm going to heat the pad and the wire at the same time, and I'm going to bring my soldering wire and put it onto the soldering iron tip, right? If your soldering iron tip is nicely uh, ironed or nicely tin, like mine is here, it's nicely uh, silver like that, it will automatically um, flow onto the PCB. So again, with the right connection here, soldering iron goes onto the pad, Solder wire goes onto the pad as well, heats up on top of the soldering iron, and it flows onto the pad. Now, this should no, take no longer than three seconds. If your soldering iron is on the board for more than three seconds, you're in trouble. All right? So, as you can see here, even when I'm demonstrating, I'm like lifting up a little bit so it just does not heat up the board too much. Because what happens if you heat the board up too much is it, you will burn the pad off. If you burn the pad off, it'll be really hard to like, recover from that. Okay, so we, now we've covered resistors, we've covered LEDs. I want to go over the SMD component. SMD again stands for someone? Surface mount device. Good. So the one surface mount device 
on the board is going to be the AMS 017. Now this is going to be our voltage regulator. It's a really nice uh, package. That's what we call like transistor chips or like how they're formed into the board. It's a really nice package and it's a really large scale too, which is a good introductory for you to learn SMD soldering. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my soldering iron once more. You notice how I'm turning it off and on as I go ahead and solder. Uh, that's a good practice just to not damage your iron. So what I'm gonna do is it's the same practice as before, only I'm gonna heat the pad and the component at the same time. I'm going to melt my solder wire onto the pad. And the cool thing is you'll notice that it kind of like attracts the component inwards, right? And you can use your solder wire to position it on the board like so and center it before soldering the legs together. And you'll notice I didn't take very long to do that, right? It was like bam, bam, bam. You don't want to take very long to solder one of these components together. Otherwise, um, you'll burn the board. Everyone got that? Cool. One last thing I want to show you before going on to the lab is how to solder these components together. These are the sockets. And you and pay attention to this because this is one of the other most common mistakes is you don't want to solder these chips directly to the board because you'll never be able to remove them. You want to solder these sockets to the board and then put the IC chips on top of them later on. All right, that's why these are there. Just to reference, this is what I'm talking about. These are IC sockets. You put these components, which are the actual ICs, on top of the IC sockets later. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them in the holes where they're supposed to be, like so. And listen closely because you don't wanna make this mistake, right? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and press this down, actually, just to flip it over. Uh, I ruined it. <laughs> uh, usually you can use masking tape for this, which is a better, better way to do it. But uh, you can also use another PCB uh, or some other component that holds it down. Actually, do I have another PCB? So normally what you can do is you can go ahead and get a PCB and hold it like this and it just flattens everything really nicely and just flip the whole thing over. And this keeps everything in place. Well, usually you want to do this step before you have all the LEDs in, uh, but this is a good demonstration for what I'm going to do next. So when you're soldering these sockets together, a very important thing to note is to not, uh, focus. okay, do not solder all of them on at once. Because what will happen is if you solder them on like a wrong way, um, you're not gonna be able to fix it ever again. And let me show you what happened. So you, you wanna solder the corners first of the IC socket like this and this, right? And when I lift, you'll see that this socket is soldered in, but it's not straight, right? There's a little bit sticking out of the board like that. And that's the result of, um, I guess, just improper placement. There's an easy way to fix this if you only solder the two corners together. Right? You can just use a finger and be careful not to touch the heated parts and press down onto the bottom of the board. Everyone see what I'm doing with the finger here? And for those on Zoom, I'm just pressing it down and then flipping it over. So I'm putting pressure on the chip and I'm heating up the pin and you hear that click. That click means that it's been pressed directly into the board now. And it's like, oh, almost. Okay. You can see now I've readjusted the component so that it's flush with the board. All right, everyone see that? So again, these components are really useful because then you can put the chip directly on it. But remember to only solder two points, adjust it, and then solder the rest. So now that I've soldered only two points, I've adjusted the IC on the board, I can go ahead and then solder the rest together. And this is where speed soldering really is fun because when you get good at soldering, you can go ahead and start going through the joints like this. Okay, and we're done. So everything is soldered. Now, 
you'll notice that this pin on the bottom here is a little bit too much solder, right? That's going to create a cold joint in the future. So to fix this, we can use our solder pump to get rid of the excess solder. So we actuate it like this, and then we heat up the joints, and we put the solder pump onto the joint at the same time, and then push the plunger. So like this. And this removes most of the solder from the board, in which you can then try again. Right? And we fix it. Okay, so after you put the socket in, then you can take out your shift register or timer or whatever IC and then put it into the board. Now, a lot of these ICs come with legs that are a lot spread out. And what you can do is to press them inwards together before you put it into the board, right? This will help put it into the socket a little bit easier because the socket is like, it's not like splayed out like the IC usually is. It's more or less enclosed. So remember that the semicircle, you want to match it with the top of the IC, because if you put it backwards, it may uh, start smoking. So then go ahead and just align it with the socket. And you want to do this after you've soldered the socket into the board, and then you will just press in like that. And if you see any pins that are like pushed outwards like this, that means they're not actually in the board, you'll have to take like a flat screwdriver or a flat head and just rip it out of the board and try again, okay? But this is bad. Don't do that. I'm going to move on now because I think many of you are itching to go ahead and try to solder this yourself. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns before we move on? All right. So now is the time for you to go to the lab, try it out, solder, and have fun. Thank you, everyone.